here at Drupal South. Uh, our talk today is about how and why we created a modular distribution for Drupal 8 and covers our success and some of our pain that we've had on our journey so far. Uh, my name is Daniel. I've worked with Sparks Interactive since 2014 as a back-end developer and I'm also the technical head of sector, uh, our open source distribution. The Drupal 8 rebuild has been one of the most exciting things that I've been a part of in my career, and it wouldn't be possible without the backing of Sparks. Sector has been really successful for us as a business, and we only got this far through all the experience and pain of building sites for the last 10 years. For some of the background as to why Sparks chose to commit to Sector, and what we did before Sector, I brought in Heike. Cool, so Sector in a nutshell. Sector is an open source Drupal distribution that's ready to go and easy to administer. It's built on a flexible framework, provides pre-configured authoring tools, content types, file management, everything you need, and more. Sector basically gets you from step one to step 20 without you needing to do all the work every single time you build a new site. It's just already done. Hiker and I are supported by an awesome team in Wellington. We have everything from developers, uh, developers to testers, to designers, to content, everything, with a great support by our Auckland office. Uh, Sector's been a four-year journey for us at Sparks, and all the work and choices we've made have led us to where we are now with Sector Drupal 8. This talk morphed multiple times while I was, talk uh, while I was writing it, but it ended up being a case study on our sector experience and why we think modular distributions just make sense. In a few moments, I'm going to hand over to Heike for a history lesson uh, and some business stuff that's way above my pay grade. Uh, and then I'll come back and talk about the technical details that are going on in sector. At the end, if we have time, we'll talk about the contributions that have been made because of sector and some of the sites we've built and how a modular distribution enhanced that experience. So at this point, I'll hand over to Heike. Very good. Um, so, uh, doing distribution, if you have more than two Drupal sites, um, is an absolute no-brainer. Um, who wants to click a thousand buttons every single site? I don't. Um, so, you can deliver your sites quicker and with less risk. You can reduce your technical debt. You can consolidate your build processes back in front. You have a common toolbox to prototype and iterate faster. Um, a common editorial experience, a common customer support strategy, common test scripts, common test strategies, and a shared documentation and editor guides. Now you will see this list later because we are going to tell you how we met all of those goals um, in the sector story. Now, uh, why not contribute to an existing distribution? Uh, there are many reasons, different points of views and needs, governance, change control, small fish, we are small fish, um, big fish, first and experience of tension and struggles within the Drupal, Drupal community, but there are many more. Um, now, the main reason that sector uh, is that sector is older than most. Um, so the sector story is four years old, but we started this whole process way earlier, and we were so far down the road when the other distributions came up that the only thing we know we needed to do was to open source, which we did. Oh, I'm sorry, I have to sorry, control now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, um, in around 2013, um, 
Thanks, Hacker. So, deliver your sites quicker and with less risk. All the sites now have the same base, the same configuration we can trust, as long as a developer or a site builder hasn't done anything too funny. Uh, we know the basics are just going to work. Pass. Uh, reduce your technical debt. We kind of missed this one. Uh, yes, we reduce technical debt in the way that all the sites have the same base and are less custom. But the sector in itself carried a lot of weight and a lot of technical debt. Uh, so we didn't quite achieve our goals here, not to our standards. Uh, consolidate build processes back and front. Uh, in particular on the front, we moved towards Yarn, we modernized our front end tools, we added documentation and processes to use. Now everyone at Sparks and everyone using sector, they use the same tools. Pass. Uh, a common editorial experience. This was really valuable. We have a suite of sites, many sites, that share editorial teams. We don't want them to have to understand five different admin backends, five different range of content types. We want it to all just be scalable and shareable so that one, one editorial team can manage sites. Uh, pass. Our, customer, our, our, our uh, editorial teams, they rave about this, so it's good. Uh, a common uh, customer support strategy. It's a little bit out of what I do, but the customer support team, they know sector well. A lot of times, they can just fix things without even needing to escalate it further. It just works well, so pass. Common test scripts and strategies. Again, all the sites have the same base, so they have the same test scripts, the same test strategies. We just build upon them for custom features that we build every site. Pass. And shared documentation editor guides. One of the powerful things about Sector is our documentation site, Sector NZ. I reference it all the time. This documentation team has done awesome work open sourcing all of our documentation. Things no longer just really need to exist in one person's head anymore, which is always a problem with the way we do things. So pass. So despite missing one of our goals, we really liked what we did with Sector. We were seeing a massive improvement in how we build sites our processes and our efficiencies. It made sense to us that others might like this as well. So we committed to open sourcing sector in 2015, and we achieved it. Moving from closed source to open source was hard. We had, a lot, we had Spark specific data, we had to do rounds of testing, rounds of removal, sign offs, everything. Uh, it was non-trivial, as you can imagine. So, after all that, the important thing is that Sector 7 was successful, all things considered. But just to bring us back down to earth, there were things we did wrong and things that just didn't quite work the way we envisioned it. First one being that everything was too big. As part of development in Sector 7, well, in the closed source, 
we used a lot of contra modules to achieve the functionality we wanted. The first closed source version of Sector had everything, varnish, solar, media, workbench, maps, it had everything and more. When we made the decision to open source Sector, we didn't really strip these things out, we just disabled them. This led to a bloated distribution and module security updates hurt us continuously just by the sheer amount of modules that were in the distribution. Features. Not uh, bagging on features at all, there was no other alternative in Drupal 7, and the team built an amazing tool. I mean, it was incredible. Uh, but partly due to our own implementation, it just caused us a lot of pain. We had the right idea of building a modular distribution in Drupal 7, but everything was just uh, included in the, in the base, so the benefit wasn't really there. Uh, dependency hell, potentially a few people here have done this themselves as well. Um, because of how many contribs and features we had, uh, things just, a lot of things end up relying on other things. So if you need to turn off a module, it's, you can't, or it's difficult because it's relied by four different other things or one other thing. This was a really big pain point with our developers in Sector 7. It just was really annoying. <laughs> uh, technical debt. To get around the features limitations, we had a lot of custom code in Sector. Um, if APIs changed or things broke, things had to be fixed manually uh, and features had to be rebuilt. This happened often with uh, contrib's like password policy and web form. And the last one is painful to make changes and hard to maintain. Long installation times, features prone to mistakes, long testing cycles, just because of the sheer amount of content and config. Sorry, Heike. Very good. So, um, uh, Daniel, just the sector seven, that's fair enough. <laughs> um, so, um, sector the eight is rebuilt from scratch, technology-wise. The non-technology foundation but remained the same, so we had this huge head start. Um, we just basically set out to, oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> we just set out to, um, so now that we could actually build what we wanted to build in the first place, only better. Each um, element in the sector ecosystem follows the same principles. Now, some of them are familiar, while some of them go way further. So, uh, yes, you need some consistent approach to Drupal, so you need some really standards here. Um, you need some display, install hooks back to, back to the starter kit. So, um, this is all what Daniel um, does on a day to day basis. But they also are cons a composer installable, they plug and play, they have head centered code review. Each, um, uh, uh, each add on has at least two documentation pages on sector and that one for site builder, one for editorial teams. You have the projects pages on drupal.org and you have useful and usable sample content and everything needs to have an online demo. Cool. So, um, now Daniel is going to tell us how he cleaned up. I got this one, I can't. Oh, sorry. <laughs> cool. Now that we've looked back at the history and some context, uh, we can look behind the scenes at how we fixed the problems in sector D, uh, from D to sector D7. Uh, so this will talk about scaling by add-ons, no features, no dependency hell, less technical debt, and a talk about the future. So scaling by add-ons. So, as we talked about, the first problem was that Sector 7 was just too bloated. Sector 7 had almost 100 contrib modules. It did everything we needed it to do and more. It was just too heavy. Like I said before, security updates, they really hurt us. Uh, so it was time to clean this up. We moved uh, some, contrib, uh, some contrib and config into add-ons. And as we continued to trim the fat, we saw a 50% de decrease, or over 50% decrease, in the, size of, in the amount of contra modules, 
And as a, size a side effect, we saw a 62% decrease in build size. Both these things will keep dropping further as we trim fat and really clean up our starter kit. Now, creating the add-on system was something we came up with early in Sector 8, and it was my number one priority. We're really starting to see the results of this as time goes on. Add-ons will be covered more as we go, but the idea is simple. In the same way you extend Drupal, you can extend Sector. Uh, and, and the last step is removing complex content types and unnecessary config from the profile. For Sector 8, we removed everything non-essential and took the distribution back to its roots. It's got a core, it's got a theme, and it's got opinions uh, on what the best practices for the start of a Drupal site are. Sector 7 had years of config and legacy uh, come across from the closed source project, like Solar and Varnish. Does every single site you use have Solar or Varnish? No. So we ripped them out, and in time we'll create add-ons. And the same goes for content types. Sector 7 had eight content types, including multi-pages, which is our version of books, and a media gallery. Does every single site you build really need a media gallery? No. So out they went as well. Uh, so for a visual representation of what add-ons actually look like, let's have a look at a couple. So if we scroll to the bottom and we go to events, every add-on starts with a landing page. So it's got a landing page and then it's got some content. This one here, it saves with location map, but since Google changed some of their policies and we don't really want to open source our key, Let's just, let's just pretend there's a map. So straight out of the box, you can see there's really nice design. We've got a couple of different displays with blocks. We've got a node view. And as we scroll down, we can just see everything is nice. We've got good, realistic sample content. It's what an event should look like. It lets you see how things are and take them further if you need to. And then if you scroll back down to the footer and open up the blog, It's the same thing. It starts with a landing page. It's got some nice designs, some nice uh, blocks. It starts with a featured uh, blog post and then just keeps going down into some uh, like landing page style view content. So if we go into the featured one, Hiker. So same thing. Nice style, well designed, good realistic sample content is the important thing links, and all the links go to our documentation pages, so your site builders and your content editors can see some examples and how things should work. Uh, and if we have time at the end, we can have a look at some of our more complex add-ons like Media Gallery, but I think by now you're really starting to get the idea of what an add-on should encompass. So the starter kit itself in the sector has been reduced to four content types. We have page, an article, uh, which is, oh sorry, news, which is article and core, uh, resources and promotions, which both come from sector. The remaining content types from the starter kit in D7 have become or in the pipeline of becoming add-ons. This keeps our starter kit light. So for this talk, we'll use sector events as our example. Sector events it requires three contrib modules, address, geolocation, and geolocation address link. In Drupal 7, that would have been three extra contribs that are bloating up the profile that don't need to be there because not every site needs an event. So when you have security updates in Sector 8, when address is a security issue, all the sites that don't use events just don't need to worry. It doesn't matter anymore. Uh, it's a win-win. So how are add-ons designed? Our goal for add-ons is that they're minimal impact. I think all of us have seen when you install a module sometimes, it attaches itself everywhere, and then it's a spider web of trying to figure out where things come from, how to remove it. I didn't want that. I really wanted the add-ons to be this little isolated bundle that you can just install and remove if you want to. So they're meant to be low impact. Plug and play. They're all just plug and play. You turn them on, they're there, they have content, you just go. They can be extended. Uh, all config comes bundled in as part of the add-on. And when I say here, I say, and not much more, 
I really do mean it. Uh, our add-ons come with very little back-end code. Most of the time, it's just minor install tasks to do things like set permissions or create sitemaps, things that don't, aren't well handled with config at this point. And sample content. This is really important. We have good, we have realistic sample content that's been made by our documentation team. People can really visualize what the content looks like, and then they can start extending it and see what they want to do in the future. So moving on to the technical side of things, I wanted to go over what the code structure of an add-on looked like. So again, we've got the sector events, and if we start by going into config, and into install, and if we scroll down here, are all the config files that are part of add-on, there's about 30. Everything is just already done. Fields, <laughs> content types, displays, views, vocabs, it's all just there. And I don't really know about you, but I don't want to be clicking all of these buttons and doing all of this config every single time I need an event content type. Uh, it's just painful, it's easy to miss. Which one of us hasn't missed a checkbox in a collapsed field set or not press save after doing a thousand things on a form? This just works. So while we're at it, let's go back to events. and into the content. So this is using the uh, default content module, and every, all add-ons come with terms, pages, the newer ones come with also media and files, so everything's just there, out of the box, and it works. So what I really wanted to demonstrate here is that this is 30 to 35 plus files that aren't part of the distribution anymore. They're in an the add-on, the distribution doesn't care about them, and if you need them, they're there. It keeps the starter kit light. And more importantly, it keeps sites that aren't using events light. And the other part of most sector add-ons are minor install tasks. So just really little things. You can see that we are granting permissions to content editor, we're granting permissions to content admins, and we are creating an XML sitemap context for the event content type. With all things, like with all, most of our add-ons, this is the majority of install tasks that, or like of back-end code that's there. There's not really that many moving pieces that can go wrong. The goal is just to have everything that works and isn't gonna mess with you. Cool. So the pros and cons of this really become more obvious as we go along. No mistakes. The config is all handled by the add-on and the awesome Drupal configuration system. There's no manually checking or missing boxes. We don't really have to worry about these things anymore. Just works. They're well tested. We use these add-ons at Sparks, and as more people use them, or as with any module, as more people use them, they get tested as they go along. We open source our issue queues, just using standard Drupal issue queues. So everything is just there, everything works, they're tested. Uh, and the cons, they're also pretty easy. The add-ons are tied to sector, obviously. If you add sector events to Lightning, it's probably not gonna work. Uh, and the last one is that things can break if major changes have been made to your instance of sector. Let's say, for example, you delete the body field. Maybe things aren't gonna work. <laughs> so, at the moment, they really do require a pretty clean version of Sector. We've actually done some kind of preliminary reviews to see if we can mitigate this, but at this point, that's just how it is. So when we first started coming up with the idea of add-ons, I think there was a bit of concern in the team that they would really begin to limit us, that using the same base would make sites follow a kind of cookie-cutter pattern, everything would have the same look, we want our developers and our designers to actually enjoy their work and not feel like their creativity is being stifled by us. So the add-ons are fully extendable. I mean, they're mostly, they're mostly just standard Drupal configuration. Uh, you get all the nice stuff that comes in the add-on and you can do anything extra that you want to. So for this, let's have a look at two sites. 
Forest and Bird and Totra Learning both use the exact same version of sector events as their base. So if we start with Forest and Bird, we see upcoming events, the same one we saw before. See a ton of filters. We've got one event uh, per row with a bit of metadata based on you know, dates, tags, an image if it's been applied. And then if we go to Totra, again, exact same upcoming events view. They've changed the label, there's a filter, and now we've got four events per row, required image, bit of meta, and this whole masonry style layout. Both of these sites, they have the exact same base, but they look totally different. They have their own flares, their own special things, but the same underlying base. So, no features. Like I said before, Features was the best tool for its time. We built modular features, but we didn't do it in the right way. And uh, we had way too many features. At certain points, we split content types up into a content type feature, a permission feature, a content feature. We had everything. We had this great vision of the modular distribution. We just didn't quite pull it off in the right way. It made things hard to maintain and hard to keep track of. And to be totally honest, while I can pretend to take a lot of credit for the work in this, uh, for removing the boat, uh, for the bloat, a massive chunk of this was solved by the amazing work done by the Drupal 8 team and the configuration management system. Changes are easier, I get less grumpy, and things just work out of the box. We clean this up as we go, um, but it just works with the add-ons and with the, core, uh, and the starter kit, and even better when you combine Drush CMI tools. Uh, dependency hell. So again, this is really solved, let's say on day one, with the, how we decided, decided to build Sect8. It was an architecture issue. The starter kit it only depends on the most critical modules for the installation of the profile. The add-ons, they only depend on the new modules that they bring in. And again, no more features. This was our real spider web in Sector 7. With features gone, a lot of the dependency hell just disappears. So with Sector 8, if you need to disable a module on a per-site basis, you don't really have to do this fight anymore or worry that it's not going to work. It just works. Less technical debt. Now, you remember from the slides earlier, this was the goal that we just didn't really achieve, that we didn't feel right about. So there are countless examples through Sector 7 code base where we build and change really significant things on the fly to get around features limitations and where things just didn't work how we wanted them to in Sector. This consistently led to issues where things broke. Where is it broken? Is it broken in a feature? Is it broken in custom code? Is it broken somewhere else in the module itself? It was just a really annoying debugging process. So in the demo, here's an example of this. Here we're building a password policy from scratch with code to get around a feature limitation. And at some point, password policy, we ran updates, and they made this API change with the uh, ID. And then the feature broke, and we had to figure out how. And the fix ended up being this one-liner. There are countless examples of this. Plenty of annoying commits with potentially grumpy commit messages. But in Drupal 8, uh, in Sector 8, we've resolved this as much as possible. The only custom code we have in Sector 8, we still have the install, the install tasks, but they're really minor, and they generally only touch core or really well-trusted contrib things, like XML sitemap or remapping sample content. Cool. So, on to exciting times, the future. There's a lot to get excited about as we move into the future. For me, the number one thing is adoption. We know that uh, us and some other people are slowly starting to adapt sector, but we really want sector to be used on a wide scale. We want to see adaption. We want to see people testing, building sites, playing with sector. Our governance module on Sector NZ talks about how to get involved if you want to contribute back to sector, 
if that's something you'd be interested in. But really our goal is just to have people playing with it, trying out the add-ons, trying out Sector, giving us feedback. We want more people having eyes on it. So, we're finally moving beyond the beta status. Sector 8 kind of feels like it's been eternally in beta for a while. Um, the only thing missing is the 1.0 release and the big green tick on Drupal. We have a couple of small blockers that are stopping this from happening, but we really want to fix this. So the blockers are the, uh, well, one of the main blockers for me on a personal level is automated tests. We want Sector and the add-ons to have an automated test and an automated test strategy. Uh, Hiker and I, we both really wanted this all fixed and the 1.0 released before this conference, but there's this little annoying thing called client work that just kept coming up and getting in the way. As much as I want to work on Sector all the time, there is still a business and we do still have to actually get paid. Uh, and the other future plans are to keep developing add-ons. Newer add-ons are always in development for Sector 8 as they, are come, like, as they are needed by clients. Over the last year and a half, we've been making up the missing content types from Sector 7, but others are being added to the pipeline as they come up. So how we develop add-ons. We have a few different processes for how we choose new add-ons for the Sector D7 eco uh, D8 ecosystem. The first is missing bits from the Sector 7 version. Sector 7 could be complicated, but it had everything. It had workflow, which me and Heiko are talking about tomorrow. It had embargoed content, it had multi-pages. Uh, it had editable views, paste from Word, Solar, Varnish. It had everything. So we ripped all those things out, but we'll still need them again so they get added to the pipeline. And the rule of three, this is the rule that I follow, well, well, the next two points actually go hand in hand. More than one client asks for a feature, and the rule of three. My personal development process is to follow a rule of three, which is a pretty classic kind of uh, philosophy. If I've built something twice, I'm probably gonna need it again. Um, so that's when we think about turning custom code into a library or a module, or in this case, an add-on. So just here's a quick example of our add-on pipeline. We have membership and feedback form. These two here are examples of add-ons that didn't actually exist in seven, but have been prioritized for our, eight, our Drupal 8 clients. Multi-page and workflow, they're both from seven. They need to come to eight. We've actually built workflow in eight, which me and Heike will talk about. And to make the list not massive, we'll just stop here. Contribute, it's one of our big things. If we see a feature as having value, not to just us at Sparks, but as the, the wider Drupal community and adapters, adopters of Sector, we publish it. The goal here is to really have all this stuff open source. Open source contributions. So this was a bonus that I didn't really consider too much when I started building the Drupal 8 version of Sector. Because Sector touches everything from nodes, blocks, media, sitemaps, everything in between, we've been able to fix bugs and raise issues in core and contribs like the list above. We've also found contribs that we think have a lot of value but have been a bit unmaintained as time goes on, like term condition and advanced form. It's given us an opportunity to take over maintainership of those modules and uh, keep working in the wider Drupal community. We're publishing sector and working in this kind of sector world, but we want to keep contributing to Drupal outside of sector as well. Uh, on our documentation site, Sector NZ, we have a showcase page. So on this page, we have a lot of our Drupal 8 and Drupal 7 sites that we've built recently, Heart of the City, Head of the Sector for Forest and Bird, the Ombudsman, Bird of the Year, and Child Youth Wellbeing.
Great. So that's everything we wanted to talk about with Sector. Do you guys have any questions? Um, the microphone. <laughs> Uh, the process of adding an atom, like, is it like a, is, is it a quantum module that I will add? If yes, what happens to the configuration? Do we export it? Do mm, so we it's all it? it's all just standard. They're all published as contrabs. Yep. So we have like sector events. They're all published on Drupal.org. All you need to do is compose or require it, like any other <laughs> contrib, enable it on your Drupal site, and all the configuration will just be there. Right. So, so basically, it's, it's, it's like like a developer or a DevOps person. At the moment, there isn't like a UI that lets you do it. Yeah. No, so it is still like a task where you need to right. edit your composer and yeah. publish it. Yeah. But we haven't done anything, <coughs> like we haven't done anything on the sector team. We haven't done anything on those add-ons. They look like this once they are installed. Yeah. Uh, the only thing that we have done here is to add this block to the starter kit and this module to the starter kit because this is just how the demo works. Yes. But we have not, we haven't touched any, we haven't even fixed the bug with the, with the yeah. maps because like it's just, what you see right. is what you get. Yeah. yeah, that's what sector looks like straight out of the box. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, what about en entering content? Are you using like the body field or paragraph or something like that because I noticed that you have different type of like list or images or you know different UI elements in yep. the in the main content of the site so how do you build that uh, it's all just using standard Drupal fields so we have the body field which has our WYSIWYG and all of our like WYSIWYG toolbar and tools but there's no in the add-ons there's no magic it's all just Drupal config comes with sector there's nothing too scary going on behind the scenes. So this is what we mean with, <coughs> um, with the site building focus. So when you go, for example, um, on sector, I'll just show you one of the pages. So if you go to documentation and you search for the block add-on. Uh, very good. Um, so this is the site builder um, configuration um, uh, 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 documentation for the sector add-on. So it lists all, everything that is there. It lists all of the um, components, where they are, what we have done. So basically, um, uh, all of this is pre-configured, but we also tell you exactly what we have done. Mm -hmm. And we also, further down, we tell you what then, if, if Daniel has done something, I think he has done nothing <laughs> for the blog. Yeah, yeah, so he has done nothing on the blog. Um, there is one where we have manipulated a trick file. Do you remember that? There is the, oh, that's the quiz, I think, which oh, isn't okay, public yet. <laughs> <laughs> so if we manipulate, uh, or if you require patches or um, additional contribution module, this definitely requires an additional contribution Oh, yeah, an example of that is the media gallery, oh, actually. Media gallery. Yeah. Okay. No, it's a, a core. A core? Yeah, a core patch. If you just search patch, it'll probably be there. Okay. Ah, yes. Yeah. So this is a core patch that goes with that module because something didn't work. Yeah, so basically there's a core issue that we need to fix to make the media gallery work. But because we still wanted to make progress and we still wanted to publish it, we just at the moment have the little note that says if you want to install the media gallery, this core patch is needed as well. But the sector team is actually working on that patch to get it into core. Uh, sorry, I was just wondering about the anatomy of the add-on modules. Like, What proportion of them is just YAML config files? Mm -hmm. I assume in config install folder, right? Yeah, yep. yep, that's right. And then how much of it is like 
are there twig templates? Is there CSS, or is all of that deferred to something else like a, the base theme? Or so it does. Yeah, it does depend a little bit per add-on. Like most of our add-ons are strictly generally just config files, that little few install tasks, and then with CSS, a lot of the times for our really custom add-ons, our really common add-ons, we just add the CSS to our distribution and then uh, just have them disabled by default and turned on, or just there in the distribution already because our very clever front-end developer, he has built a modular CSS style that means sometimes for these add-ons, you don't even need to add any more CSS. You can just use the stuff that's already there in sector. Yes, there is a, a base theme in the base distribution. Yeah. 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 So, and this is why we, um, why we also issue these warnings here. Yeah. So in this case, Tom needed to put, but the CSS is really minimal. Tom needed to put something in so it has a dependency. Um, if you want to look at really good, um, uh, you need to use data file. I also want, at this stage, I also want to explain something about the use of display um, suite and uh, view mode. So every single add-on ships with a short teaser and a teaser display. And the short teaser and the, dis and the teaser displays, they are built to work in any sector starter kit view. So it's all really streamlined. So that's probably a good segue to my next question, which is how have you had issues with config dependencies? So say, for example, you've got, uh, let, let's say you wanted to add the workflows module, which is in core, right? And the workflows module has a reference to the content types that are part of it. Yeah. But yeah. The, the content types that are part of it are obviously dynamic because they change yes. depending on the site. So in scenarios like that, do you just ship stuff that you know is going to be there from the starter kit and then stuff that's an add-ons from the events and stuff you just have to manually configure? I mean, if the site owns the configuration, it's not yeah, really a problem. Yeah, you raise a really interesting, and we talk about this tomorrow a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, workflow is our most ambitious ambitious uh, uh, project so far because um, we just use core but we use core um, with some really amazing work Daniel has done. Um, however, um, uh, so we are at the moment just in a bit of a, uh, uh, we need to get oh, Sorry, I mean, Workflows was just an example. Have there been other, like, No, so far, pitch? so far, we don't need to tick a single box, but we can't promise you that we don't need to tick a yeah, single yeah. box because we ran into this issue with the workflow add-on. And uh, we are not fighting the system, but for example, what, uh, what Daniel was showing on the XML sitemap, there's a little install hook because we can't configure the XML sitemap that it yeah, uh, should know, include this, so there's a little install hook. Um, and there are also install hook into the permissions management um, because everything is just consistent and it just builds on top and on top of each other. Yeah. Cool. And just to say one more thing as well, like for uh, for example, we have a content audit add-on, so it's an add-on that really gives your, editori your editorial users a lot of control. Um, it just provides extra fields. And what we do for that one, because we don't want to attach it to content types, to all content types on install, because maybe you don't want that, we just provide a checkbox in the uh, content edit screen that just says enable sector content audit for this content type. So out of the box, it's it's there, but not actually attached, and then you can attach it as you like per go. We have time for last question. Yeah, just wanted to confirm that something like this, that ImageFX module is required and there is a patch. I'm assuming you are putting that in the composite.json of the add-on? Uh, for the core patch, we didn't at the time. I think there was an issue, but the, the modules themselves, the modules themselves, they're so part they're of the composer JSON. So you do composer require mm. sector media gallery, no, and no, that pulls fine. in everything. So this one media gallery, sector media gallery, mm -hmm. it needs a core patch and it needs those modules. Yep. So the sector media gallery should be having a composer JSON, mm -hmm. and that mentions all this as well. Right? Yes, correct. Yeah, the the core patch is the one really unique kind of outlier in all of the systems so far. Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>